Okay, uh, so I think that uh, the first thing that we want to do um, is to kind of get a couple of news updates that are uh, like kind of like hot off the presses, just like very like live, like round of updates of situations that are happening in both Chiapas and uh, Northeast Syria, um, because it's actually kind of a dire situation in both cases. And so I think that, you know, given, given, given the actual subject of what we want to talk about today, um, I think it's worth kind of starting off with that. So I know that we have Optikin here, who's going to tell us about the situation in Chiapas. Um, and we have Anya, who's going to tell us about Northeast Syria. So I think that Optikin, do you want to, do you want to go first? Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, the attacks on the autonomous Zapatista communities have been increasing since the so-called leftist president who goes by the initials AMLO has been elected to power. Uh, and recently, I'm going to share with you a link to the Chiapas Support Committee, which is one of our member organizations in Sexta Grieta del Norte here in the United States. They make a lot of translations. So if you look at their posts, recent posts, since the beginning of this year alone, there have been about six posts about attacks increasing in these communities. They are focused right now in the northwest part of the state of Chiapas in Mexico, which is located between Guatemala and the Pacific Ocean, kind of in the southeastern corner of Mexico. And uh, they have been attacking one of the new caracoles, the caracol number 10, which is also known as uh, Patria Nueva or Floreciendo la Semilla Rebelde, flowering uh, the rebellious uh, seed. And you will see if you go to Twitter and follow the posts, you will see a community of Nuevo San Gregorio, which is all the same, you know. There's basically the three names used are the names the Zapatistas give to this region, the names the uh, Mexican government gives to this region, and the Caracoles have usually poetical names like the, you know, flowering uh, rebellious seed. So uh, they have been doing this since the beginning of, and then since the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, these attacks on uh, Caracol 10, shortly after its establishment, actually. Originally, they had about 155 hectares, which had been uh, liberated in 1994. Of those 155, this is approximately 400 acres in US terms. Uh, only three and a half have remained in the control of the Punta de Buen Gobierno, only 40 people, 40 armed people, paramilitaries are holding the rest of the uh, territory right now in their hands. They started by fencing some uh, key places like the water tanks and the, the, the school actually, they, they fenced the school off so they can't use the school anymore. And there have been two caravans of solidarity in the past two years. One just uh, was organizing beginning of this year in January. Another community under attack, it's not one of the Caracoles, but it has been in, un, under attack in really the last decade, more or less, is the community of Aldama. It's also north of San Cristobal. So, this is, uh, I think this is a very typical effect of, uh, you know, looking at a social democratic government and thinking, oh, everything is solved. We are free. Everything is fine. It is not fine. As long as capitalism is in power and dominating our tierra, our, our, our lands, really, we have problems. We, we will never be free under that system. So uh, I was going to ask you just to follow the announcements on Twitter or uh, on any social media, Facebook, Instagram, we are represented on all of them. You can find us at at Sexta Grietas or at Sexta Grietas del Norte on Facebook. And uh, give us your love, your digital love by sharing our news, listening to our videos and our posts, reading our posts. And thank you all also for being here today, because this is actually there are uh, 
I think Ariella is also a member of the sexta, if I remember it correctly, right? <laughs> so we have we, we have four members of uh, who who are in both organizations right now. So I'm very very happy to see that growing more and more. Okay, I'll take over Thank here. You. Thanks, Al. Well, actually, actually, Anya, yeah, do you mind ahead. if I say something real quick? So I, I wanted to, I know that we have a lot of uh, new people in the audience, uh, or, or at least people whose faces I don't recognize. Um, and so I want to just kind of say, uh, in, in case you're having trouble following all the different like names and stuff, um, Sexta Grietas del Norte is a uh, internationalist organization that's kind of based in the continental United States um, that is predominantly, it seems, uh, like... Mexican Americans or Mexican descended um, uh, people who are who are organizing in solidarity with the Zapatistas. That's kind of like the the actual goal of that organization. Um, in a very analogous way to the way that here we at ECR uh, organize in solidarity with Roj with the people of Northeast Syria with Rojava. Um, and so I think that um, there's naturally a lot of overlap between our two groups. There's naturally a lot of things that you know we have in common. That's the whole point of why we're having this book club. Um, and so I think that like one of the things that both the Zapatistas and the Kurds in Northeast Syria would say is that your your praxis, like as you're learning, you should learn by doing. And so that's kind of why we do things like this. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was, uh, Alpatikun, do you want to briefly explain what, what the Karakoles are, um, just in case people are, are wondering? Yes, sure. Uh, these were after the original up up uprising in 1994. These were the bases de apoyo, the bases of support, which were created in Chiapas. And they were called at that time Aguas Calientes. They were renamed to Caracoles, which is the word for snail in, uh, in Spanish, which is actually, they, they uh, picked this name in, in intentionally because they said, we are gonna move slowly. This is not something revolution happened today and tomorrow we are done. You know, most in, in the old days of revolutionist theory, people were thinking, you do a revolution, take power, and you are done, it's over. That's not how the Zapatistas see the revolution as a continuous process, a continuous process of growth and development. So that's why they picked that name, snail. Also, snail is a symbol of communication in indigenous communities in uh, South America and Central America. So they, they are also places where people gather. If you have been to any of these caracoles, you will see buildings and they, they have big joists at the top where people hang their hammocks when they are visiting. So they are basically places where people gather, celebrate, play basketball. You know, there, there are uh, tiendas, there are uh, stores where they sell stuff and they are also uh, places where they organize their defense. So basically community centers, they are also the centers of the Juntas de Buen Gobierno, the councils of good government, which are, if, if you look at the, at the Rojava context, these are similar to the cantons, I would say, the Caracoles. So I hope that gives an idea of what they are. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That that cleared up a lot of uh, misconceptions for me, at least. <laughs> Thank, thanks a lot, Um Anya, I'm really sorry to have cut you off. Do you want to do you want to go with your update now? Not at all. I thought that was very useful. I'll click in. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, so um, it's very unfortunate that we have to start with the bad news for both contexts. Uh, both projects uh, have been under attacks recently. And I'll be short because actually I I'm curious to hear from other people who follow the situation in Rojava. And I know some people are here do follow it pretty closely. Um, so there was an attempted uh, uh, prison break by ISIS members in Hasekan, which is a town in Northeast Syria, uh, what we call Rojava. Um, luckily the prison break uh, has not been successful and the SDF, the uh, um, Autonomous Administration's forces uh, have been able to contain the uh, prison um, outbreak attempt, but uh, it has taken them consider considerable effort. And uh, um, from so some reports uh, I've seen, uh, uh, there were lives uh, lost uh, uh, 
in the uh, autonomous administration's forces as well as they were fighting um, the uh, ISIS prisoners who tried to escape the, the, the prison. And uh, the prison outbreak uh, was um, apparently, from what I've read, organized both by ISIS members inside the prison and um, ISIS sleeper cells outside the prison. And you know, those who follow the situation, uh, you must know that uh, ISIS hasn't been defeated. Uh, the caliphate, the, their control of the territory has been defeated, but there are still a lot of ISIS cells uh, who uh, constantly, quite regularly carry out uh, attacks uh, on the autonomous administration. And um, another significant part uh, um, that we should uh, uh, mention when talking about this prison outbreak is that Turkey uh, apparently, you know, uh, carried out si simultaneous attacks on the administration, uh, autonomous administration's territory uh, to apparently kind of undermine its capacity to co contain the ISIS insurgency. Um, they, um, in particular, they uh, carried out a drone attack on one of the SDF units, military units that uh, was uh, carrying like uh, reinforcements um, for those uh, units that were fighting ISIS and Hesake. So that seems to be quite intentional on part of Turkey. And of course, we all know that Turkey has been supported both ISIS and um, other jihadist forces in the region. Um, and um, Again, um, the longer the, the uh, story that has been unfolding much longer than this uh, one incident um, of ISIS, uh, attempted ISIS uh, prison outbreak is that Turkey and its uh, jihadist allies um, in the territories that they occupy um, in Northern Syria, that they have been occupying since uh, 2019, they have been carried out, carrying out uh, constant attacks, uh, both on the ground and air attacks. Uh, Turkey, you know, has been targeted, uh, has been targeting um, political activists uh, within Rojava with its drones, and uh, uh, the drones uh, are do contain um, U.S. Uh, provided parts. Uh, so we are calling, you know, for to for the United States, for the Biden administration to stop funding and providing armed uh, military support to Turkey because uh, it is clearly using you know, um, uh, its military forces uh, in order to undermine the revolution. Um, but I'm curious, Flint, uh, since you are working with the, the Syrian Democratic Council here, representation here in the United States, I wonder if you have any other details, info to share. So you, you pretty much covered it. I mean, the, the situation with the prison break is, is evolving. Um, hopefully it will all be sorted out and there won't be any follow-up attacks. Uh, but yes, uh, Turkey has been engaged in both attacking the SDF at this time, and I believe also did an attack on Sinjar as well this weekend. Um, so that's, that's also relevant as part of their general hostility to the Kurdish freedom movement everywhere. Yep, on that negative note. Back to you, Alex and Ariella. But yeah, good news that they, um, so far it looks like they have been able to contain the uh, outbreak attempt. Right. And so I think on the note of negative news, um, if I can, I would like to add that I think that all of these things are happening within a context. And that context is like the ongoing you know, history of both of these movements. Um, like we were saying, a revolution doesn't all happen at once. And some of the like important things that happen as part of that revolution are like protecting its cultural memory, um, just kind of, like we said, learning by doing. Um, the things that are happening in Rojava around prisons especially, I think are very relevant to a lot of like our, you know, goals for like restorative justice and even transformative justice. I think like the, the way, like, you know, the, the ways that these, these prison camps are run, the ways that they're kind of like managed by the democratic confederalist kind of structure, um, all of these are very important to keep in mind as we think about, you know, what's happening with, you know, the recent prison breaks. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Paul. I don't want to, I don't want to say that the news is not negative. I'm just saying, like, thinking about it in context is good. Um, does anybody have anything to add about, about these current events? Uh, 
Sounds like no. Um, okay, so uh, Ariella, I think I've been talking a lot, so I want to make sure that uh, do you do you have like an idea for how you want to kick off the kind of structure of the actual discussion for today? Yeah, I was thinking that we start with just um, kind of a general asking of like questions and reflections about, uh, you know, the first reading, um, which I think was the Roar magazine reading um, and why we still love the Zapatistas, um, if anyone wants to begin with that. Um, and also we're going to use a method of progressive stacking. So feel free to put um, I think the plus mark or a star in the comment uh, or in the chat. Is it a, I think it's a, a star, right? Asterisk. Yeah, I think it's usually an asterisk or you can just like type the word slack, uh, stack. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, if, if you're unfamiliar with progressive stack, the way it usually works is like we try to give uh, preferential credence to like, you know, marginalized or underrepresented voices. Um, but of course everybody has, there's, you know, every, there's a rotation and everybody has a say. Um, but it's like a, it's a moderated discussion. And we'll be keeping track of everything um, as we go along. So this is an open floor. Anybody who has something to say, please feel free to, to kind of share your reflections about the reading. Uh, I, I I have a slightly complicated uh, question. It's it's not purely from the from the roar reading. Uh, it's also from the uh, the Jean Garden article about uh, Roja, uh, Rojava. Uh, if if nobody else has, I I can I can talk about. It. Um, so uh, in in the reading, I think it's it's around like section like thirty four in the uh, the Jean Garden article. There's a quote talking about this uh, internal sort of conflict within, uh, I believe at that time it was the PKK between after uh, Ashalon went into prison uh, about his role as a uh, more direct leader as opposed to uh, being turned into a symbolic leader. Um, obviously, I can imagine there's a little bit of a um, a difficulty in in having. Uh, decisions, organizational decisions being made by someone who uh, has to, I, I believe uh, from another story, like had to sneak out information through his lawyers. But, but, the, but there's an interesting quote um, to, get, to get to the point uh, where, they're, where, they're, where they're essentially saying that the, the, the autonomous women's organizations uh, won, won their, their right to remain independent, but they also did so by sort of asserting, and they, they frame this as sort of asserting Ashalon's right as more than just a figurehead. And, and I mean, the, the framing appears to be that sort of the, these existing leaders, the, these uh, leaders of the, of the sort of council that remained after Ashalon left uh, were acting in a sort of oligarchic way. But it, it is uh, initially a bit uncomfortable to think of this, this essentially a little bit of a, 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 you know, I'm coming at this as an outsider, a, what seems like, to a certain degree, a, a cult of personality. I mean, there's this role of Ashalon very clearly as someone who is pushing the movement in a, in a very positive direction, in a more um, genealogist direction. Um, excuse me if my pronunciations are bad. Uh, and it, it's, it's perfectly understandable that he, he is like pushing this movement in this direction, but there is also sort of a discomfort in the way that it's this image of a single person who is controlling all this push. And, and I think we see that a little bit with uh, Marcos uh, when he talks about uh, his role as a spokesperson. Um, I think there's some, some interesting tension there, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that, Tabitha. That was really insightful, I think. Uh, Paul, do you want to say something? Yes, uh, thank you, Alex. Um, so I, I agree with with the, the, the previous speaker that 
uh, you do have often in many movements uh, a danger uh, of, you know, decision making or initiatives, you know, coming out of, for example, one person or somehow the, you know, the great person who is, you know, uh, parachuted down to, to make all the decisions. But I think what we see in the readings is actually both in the case of Ochalan and in the case of, of, of Subcomandante Marcos, that uh, they were willing to be part of a process of transformation. I think this is really what unites uh, these two struggles. I think in the case of, of, of the Kurdish struggle, and Jongerden points this out very clearly in this and other articles, uh, with, with Akai and others about the transformation of, of the PKK. And it's clear that it did involve a great deal of listening. It involved a great deal of, you know, reaching out to what is the will uh, on the ground, uh, both in Bakur, where it is terribly suppressed. But now, I mean, with Rojava, I, I think many when, when, when Ochalan and, and the other PKK current leaders were beginning this transformation, they had no idea that, you know, the, the Rojava revolution would, would uh, occur in this way and that, you know, the Syrian civil war would provide this opening in which, you know, the, the open repression that we see by the, the Turkish dictatorship and the Turkish army, you know, was no longer being able to clamp down, at least directly. Unfortunately, <laughs> they've tried to do that even outside of their borders now. But I, I think we have a, 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 a common thread there when you look at the, the readings on the Zapatista side, when, when basically Marcos, you know, he and others had their, their cookbook of what they were going to do in, 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 in Chiapas. And then all of a sudden, they get this enormous pushback. And they realize that it can't be done that way. And they have to listen to the indigenous culture and, and to the, you know, the, the, the different Maya and other groups uh, and come up with something very, very, very different. Uh, and, you know, one, the other article was mentioning that there's been some, some pushback. But I would argue that at least from a paradigm success, from a paradigm standpoint, that's been a great su success. Now, how successful have they been able to implement their program you know, in the in the opposite, you know, with a pushback from the Mexican authority and AMLO, as 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 um, as um, Alptekin was mentioning, that's a different question. Thank you. Anya, did you wanna? Go on. Yeah, that's a great question, actually, which I've been thinking a lot about. Um, first, I want to say something about women, more specifically, because I've read, you know, some pushback by Kurdish you know, women members of the movement um, in regards to our <laughs> uncomfort feeling uncomfortable about Ojalan being such an important figure of authority, right? And, uh, you know, especially like, there is, you know, when it comes to women, there's a lot of criticism by Western feminists uh, who say, how can you have this uh, male leader and, you know, claim to organize autonomously, blah, blah. Um, and their response from what I've seen is, you know, Ojalan has been crucial in the um, development of the Kurdish women's movement. It's, I think it would be safe to say that without Ojalan's support, right, uh, his support as an authority figure in the movement and uh, an authority figure in the society, the Kurdish society more broadly, probably the women's movement wouldn't have gone so far. Right. Um, I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, we have to kind of admit the need of male you know, solidarity uh, right in projects uh, that aim uh, to change gender relations, because it's not just you know, women's project. Right. Men have to change. And you know, how do you force them? How do you convince them to do that? And I think in the example of Kurdish movement, it's clear that Ojalans, um, uh, specifically authority has played an important role. And uh, I've, um, we, we're planning to have a section, a comparative section on women's organizing in both movements. And from what I know that, you know, in the Zapatista movement as well, in the initial stages, some you know, male uh, members of the EZLN, they were not happy about women joining mil the military force and kind of participating on the equal footing. And again, there as well, the role of leadership was important in forcing this man to accept this new reality that yes, women are going to participate uh, side by side uh, 
uh, with us. So I think, um, you know, we, you know, we may need to acknowledge uh, the necessity even of, uh, you know, this type of support. And then um, my other response, just to be quick, more like a question, how do we, how do we think about you know, the situation in Rojava and the PKK, you know, uh, the way they have gone about implemented this new project of democratic confederalism. It is a project of direct democracy and sort of self-organizing, um, self-governance of communities, right, on the local level. But at the same time, we do have this, I, I think we can call it a vanguard, a vanguard force that spreads this ideology, right, PKK. Uh, or PYD, you know, the cadres uh, in Rojava who are affiliated with the PKK in some way or another, or, you know, uh, support its ideology. How do we think, that, you know, about the reality that there is a vanguard body <laughs> or bodies that, uh, try, that are trying to spread the ideology, a philosophy, a practice of direct democracy? Is that a contradiction or is that like a necessary step of transition? Okay, shut up here. Uh, Flint, you have your hand up. Sure. Uh, I'm going to go backwards, starting with Vanya there. Uh, for a very long time, probably 50 years, the United States, one of the flagship anarchist publications was in fact called Vanguard. Um, so necessarily the nomenclature of how we use terms, the question is, is it a contradiction that there is a self-selected group uh, of specific individuals and in an organization that puts forth an idea that suggests that people pick it up? No. Uh, where it would be a problem is if that organization says, we are the only organization that can exist, that can say these things and do that, and we will repress any counter view to our program. That, in fact, would be a problem, a, a, an issue. And this is actually one that the PKK struggled with over its history. And uh, the PKK's acceptance of other revolutionary currents and parties today is far different than it was 30 years ago. Uh, and what we see in Rojava is they allow all kinds of parties to exist. Uh, in fact, if anything, uh, the coalition they had built with the SDC risks being not just a united front of the left, but a popular front with bourgeoisie parties, which impedes their socialist program. So you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tension there and they have decided to go in an opposite direction than they did in the past, which gets to their change overall in a program and how that came about. Um, you know, it was a Marxist-Leninist organization with a very strong authority waging, uh, you know, a guerrilla warfare for a standard national liberation fight. And after Ojalan was captured, he and the party reviewed what they were doing and he made a suggestion to change. Uh, once he was captured, obviously he was no longer in a position to dictate how the party would go, whether he could continue to even be the symbolic leader, all of these kinds of things. Uh, but he puts out some ideas and the women's movement in particular saw an opportunity uh, in that, in him changing the, wanting to change the program and center it on radical feminism, that they were, you know, 120% for that and we're glad to have him in a, as an ally in changing the program in that way. Uh, but then inside the organization, they did a lot of the heavy lifting to make those changes, and they were not popular with everybody. They were not popular with a lot of the cadre, uh, not just the radical feminism, that if in practice they did accept women's uh, uh, liberation as an important component, they ne ne didn't necessarily want to center it on that. Uh, they didn't necessarily want to give up the struggle for a Marxist, Leninist, communist uh, state that was ethnically homogeneous. You know, these were not necessarily popular positions initially, and there was debates and arguments and discussions and readings, and uh, Oshelon's days carried uh, the position in the party eventually, and it was enacted. Uh, but there were still people uh, within the party, and more importantly, in the broader Kurdish freedom movement that weren't in agreement with these ideas, even up through the Battle of Kobani. Uh, and so it, you could probably still find individuals who dissent on this or that part of the change in the program. Uh, but this has largely been rendered moot by the success of those ideas in Rojava, 
but also the success that the movement had with the HDP in Turkey prior towards Erdogan's deciding to, you know, essentially burn down what was left of the uh, bourgeois democratic process in the country to maintain his power. Uh, but overall, the HDP is still extremely successful in its popularity within Bakur. So, and this brings me to one other point in which the leader, uh, you know, is symbolic and does provide ideas, but the, the party and the masses don't necessarily agree and follow everything he wants to do. The HDP being a good example, because in the mayoral local elections, uh, Ojalan had put out a letter uh, basically suggesting that the party shouldn't be choosing between supporting the CHP or the AKP at this time, instead maintain neutrality. Um, the letter was a little difficult to understand and there were multiple interpretations of it. Uh, but leaving that aside, uh, the HDP and uh, Candil both put out statements clearly that they wanted everyone to vote against the AKP and that election. And the masses in fact did turn out and did do that. They decided to take the advice of Candil and the HDP in that election. So on one hand, it showed both the influence uh, that Oshelon continues to have in the movement and even the influence that the AKP thought Oshelon had in the movement and in the movement's own ability to analyze the situation and come to a different conclusion and take action on it, even if it seemed to be potentially against the wishes of the leader. That's all. Uh, did you want to talk? Hi, thanks. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, uh, this issue of vanguardism has also um, bugged me a little bit. But yes, it's a, it's a big problem from, from history. So if we have a look at the, uh, I think, second international, that was Bakunin's argument against Marx, right? Not to replace, a, not to replace a state with a red bureaucracy, um, but at the same time, when an anarchist movement is, is under threat, under serious military threat from the outside, how to do this? Uh, so, um, Markno had this problem, right, when he was battling the whites and the reds at the same time, and he came up with his. Uh, idea of the platform so that that's interesting uh, is if we have a look at rojava um as, as the last speaker said um the, the other parties I, I think the big big umbrella bodies would be tev dem on the one hand and there's something like i don't know 12 parties that have actually signed the uh, rojava contract the civil contract so under tev dem you've got movements such as the PYD, which is a sister organization of the PKK and so on. But at the same time, you have the Kurdish National Council. And under the Kurdish National Council, you have many parties that are outside the Rojava contract. Right? So, I mean, you have your traditionalist um, Arab, for instance, uh, tribal leaders, as an example. Um, you have well, some of them have signed the Rojava contract, some of them not. Then, then you have the KDP influence, right? The Kurdish Democratic Party from uh, Kurdish, uh, uh, from Iraqi Kurdistan, sorry, which is basically an ethnic nationalist Kurdish party. Um, and they, they are allowed to be active in Rojava, and that's, that's a great credit to the uh, to Tevda. Um, so the question is, um, how how do you, you you've got three cantons, right? So the, the the actual revolutionary project is setting up your communes and so on, but that's only about twelve percent of the economy. So I'd say the majority of the economy is in, still in the private sector that actually drives the economy. When we have a look at oil, when we have a look at most of the imports for construction and so on, which comes out of the KRC, a lot of the, the oil is, I think, also exported 
was smuggled even to regime on the one hand a lot of a lot of it goes through the uh uh, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, probably on, onwards to Turkey. So you have, <clears throat> so you have a lot of these like disparate forces acting in unison somehow. <laughs> Which is amazing that uh, that it is. And uh, then I'd I'd like to ask the question: Do you think ANS the autonomous region of northeast syria government it's it's acting like a kind of a government right although officially ideologically is not this is an anti-state movement but it is uh it it has certain committees that are that, that can enact uh um enforcements for instance price controls um decide who is who is able to, let's say, trade with uh, the KRC, right? Because a lot of the import comes through traders, middlemen. Um, communes can't do this. Um, so there must be a lot of, so at the one hand on the communal level, you, you really have these, these, these self-governing uh, uh, organizations, but at the same time, you have to have some kind of a coordination across the three cantons when it comes to uh, pricing policy, for instance. Uh, decisions on whether the, 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 the Kandil private farmers who had tried to sell their wheat to regime, because the regime offered a higher price to them than the uh, ANS authority, which set a price floor to basically protect the uh, uh, the, the domestic consumers against price speculation. So these are these are central uh, type of if you like vanguardist, if you like uh, decisions, economic decisions that might might not not everyone can necessarily is happy with. So there's definitely this tension. Um, so I'd like. Uh, I'd like some comments on this tension. What does everyone think? <laughs> Marie, did you want to go and speak? And also just a reminder, just like uh, to hopefully stay within three minute time frame. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think it's, um, I think your, your point about the platformists um, is really interesting because it's, and this kind of idea of vanguardism, like you see it a lot in, you see it in, anarchism in the Spanish Civil War as well, like the Friends of Deruti group. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting, like, you know, the idea of vanguardism as necessarily a kind of purely Marxist-Leninist concept. It's like, I think it's the really interesting thing about Rojava is this kind of synthesis between Leninist and anarchist organizational forms, I think is really interesting. There's a really interesting, um, uh, paper that just came out called uh, Decentralized Vanguards, Women's Autonomous Power and Left Convergences in Rojava. I don't know if anyone's read it. Um, but it kind of, it, they, they define the vanguard in, in Rojava as like, um, you, you, as a, a kind of decentralized vanguard. So you have, you have this vanguard is sent, uh, you, what do they say? A revolutionary praxis that leads the revolutionary process with vanguardist central actions while pushing for decentralization and demonopolization of power and authority. And then they also say like the role of women as this revolutionary middle strata, which is also talked a bit about by the Johnsburg, how do you say his name? Johns, Johnsburg reading as this kind of counterpoint to stop the monopolization of power because obviously like, a lot of Oshelands talks about, you know, stopping the monopolization of power, but there's also this need to push the revolution change forward through, um, yeah. And I, I think it's, 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 yeah, I don't know. Don't quite know what I'm trying to say, but I guess, um, yeah, there's, there's this kind of reaction when vanguards are mentioned. And I, I don't necessarily think all vanguards are created the same, the same way.
I guess I, can, I have a thought if no, if nobody else wants to say anything for the moment. Is that okay with you, Ariella? Okay. Um, so I think that like, you know, as I'm, as I'm kind of uh, ingesting all of this, you know, uh, all of these kind of analyses, um, I think too, like, I've, I've never been to Rojava. I've also never been to Chiapas, um, but like listening to, you know, journalism from the region or like listening to interviews with, you know, people in the governance structures, especially women, um, or even listening to like uh, people who are held at the prison camps, um, listening to the comfort with which they can say things that uh, kind of criticize like the the NES regime. Um, like the way that I remember, I don't know if a lot of people here are probably familiar with like the women's war, which was the podcast that Robert Evans went to Northeast Syria and was just kind of talking to people. Um, and I remember one of the things that really struck me about that was talking to not, not just like Marxist Leninist or like anarchist, like ideological adherents, um, but talking to conservatives in the region, talking to people who are just not okay with like the kind of like level of freedom that women have at all. Um, and like longing for the old days where it was just like they could be repressed more and more. Um, and like the thing that really struck me about that was I think the same thing that the journalist actually commented on in that in that podcast episode, which is that he feels comfortable saying that. So it's like it's not, I don't know. I think that like that that means something to me, but I haven't really crystallized what it is in in my mind yet. Uh, hello. Hey, uh, if if nobody else is um, set up, I have I have some thoughts. All right. Uh, so, uh, talk, uh, what Va uh, this is sort of, I think this all sort of ties into what Flint and Vashek and you, Alex, were all sort of saying. Um, Vashek, when you talked about sort of the 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 way that the autonomous administration uh, was was acting as sort of this this uh, line line between like government and state. Uh, I I have never been able to find a truly satisfactory like bright line between what is a state and what is a government. I mean, you, you kind of ask you, you could you could ask five anarchists, you get five different answers. Uh, you ask a Marxist, you're going to get a different answer. I think a good way to think about it is. A, a, a sort of spectrum like we we know what like the platonic ideal of the state is is like this sort of jackbooted force um i think i think the reason that the common descriptor for like rojava and, and the zapatistas despite their tenuous relationship to you know more these traditionally historically european uh political structures the reason we call them like libertarian socialist and not anarchist is because there is this sort of ambivalence about what even counts as a state and what um pragmatic choices are in fact sort of required like when you talked about when you talked about the the farmers um but as as sort of Flynn and Alex pointed out this sort of idea of a an openness to different tendencies even to uh not not directly cracking down on very socially conservative tendencies, very, uh, uh, to use the Marxist term, reactionary <laughs> tendencies. Um, there, it, 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 there, is an there is always an interesting tension between the, the amount of, of, you know, the, the genuine desire to make, make sure that there is a, a free and open uh, sort of debate between these, these different, ideological perspectives. I mean, no, nobody likes it when, when, you know, the Leninists purge the anarchists, right? At the same time, I think you would talk to many, many anarchists and they would say, uh, that does not extend to like fascists or people who are like actively trying to overthrow things. I, I don't know that there's a, there's a hard line there. And, and the interesting, you know, like if a group of, <laughs> if, if, if a group of like hardline authoritarians went to go live in the Lacandon, you know, the, on, on the one hand, there's this idea, there's this idea of like, you let everybody in, uh, or it, so long as they're part, working within the community, and also like the idea that there are certain things that we just don't, don't want to allow. Um, and I, I, I think actually when we've talked a lot about Java, to sort of bring it back to 
um, Subcomandante Marcos, there is a, I will post the link. I know, I know it's not in the reading, uh, so don't worry too hard about it, but there is a very interesting letter that he wrote back in 2003. It's called, I sh it, it's, it's referred to as I should on all the revolutionary vanguards of this planet. Um, and it, it's basically him talking to, sending a letter basically uh, telling off the uh, leader of the Basque uh, organization, ETA, Euskatita uh, Skatasuna, I think. I don't know how to pronounce Basque. Um, they were, were they were essentially a Marxist-Leninist uh, organization that engaged in acts of terrorism. And one of the thing, one of the things he says towards the end is, um, we uh, we don't take anyone seriously, not even ourselves, because whoever takes themselves seriously has stopped with the thought that their truth should be the truth for everyone and forever. And sooner or later, they dedicate their force not so that their truth will be born, grow, and be fruitful, and die, because no earthly truth is absolute and eternal. Rather, they use it to kill everything that doesn't agree with this truth. I, I, I think, the, as we're sort of pointing out these, these comparisons between the Rojava and, and the Zapatistas, the sort of multi-tendency openness that we've seen in Rojava, I think, is very applicable to, to, to the ideology of the Zapatistas. Like, they're... To some, to, to some degree, you might even, there can be like questions about uh, how far that would go or how that would be practically applied. Um, and, and just finishing up, uh, as I talked about, that talks about like the issue of um, terrorism. And, and I, I know there have been, there's a longstanding sort of debate about the, the ethics of past PKK actions uh, and the, the rise of ceasefires. Uh, the, the way that Marcos comes off in, in, in this particular reading, and I, again, I know this wasn't in the, in, the, in the reading, so you know I won't go too hard on it, but is, is this very, very hard line, like we are, for, we are doing stuff for the community that we live in. Uh, the goal is not acts of offensive warfare. Um, at, at this, and, I, and, and this is something I think has maybe shifted a little bit based on what I understand in, in the Zapatista perspective, like there was this time where the Zapatistas were, were acting in a, you might have sort of went on the offensive, you might say, where they were actively trying to launch a revolution to cover a large section of Mexico. Um, obviously that, that failed. And, and then we got sort of the San Andres records and this uh, sort of pulling back. Uh, but, but, the, but the relationship between like, no, we're just doing this for like our community versus like, no, we're going to go out and try to deal with the state, the state which is, you know, cracking down on us significantly, but this, but also the state that is to some degree exterior to us. I think there's an interesting conflict in like the, the I guess, this commune tendency versus this um, interventionist tendency. Uh, I, I, again, I, <laughs> Uh, it, it, if it, you know, sort of the, I guess the the Leninist version of this would be like the Trotskyist thing of we're going to go out and we're going to do it everywhere versus like this sort of we're going to be we're just going to focus on our stuff and keep our heads down sort of thing. I am so sorry for going over time. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Anya. Um. So I think that uh, I think that Max was the first person to have their hand up. Um. Yeah. There's. I, mean, I haven't been to Rojava, so other people may have thoughts on these thoughts, but one thing that I remember David Graeber pointing out was, well, a couple of things that he pointed out, that looking around, there were no, like, there are no pictures of people. Um, there, well, apart from ones of Ojalan, or, well, there are no, I think what he said was there are no pictures of living people, but they would celebrate the martyrs and also Ojalan, which he found kind of, kind of odd. But then since Ojalan's imprisoned, he's, he was like, well, kind of in his, in his kind of silly way, crass way, he would be like, well, he's effectively dead because he's in, in lifetime imprisonment. Um, and another thing that he 
pointed out, which I think is an interesting question is an interesting analysis is that it's the relationship between the participatory communes and the NS government and scare quotes is kind of one of dual power where both are on the same side. Um, and I've had a lot of conversations with communalists who will oftentimes critique that. So um, that's also kind of a question for what people think about that. But I, mean, I think that's more of an analysis of dual power in the original Russian Revolution sense than Bukchin or modern communalist sense. But yeah, just, yeah. Oh, Ari Ariella, did you want to say something? Oh, no, I was just thinking, I think Gregory is next. I was going to say the same. Yeah, um, so uh, just kind of going a little bit back to the topic of like government versus state and sort of a lot of the more terminolo terminological part of this discussion. Um, like I, I, the way I kind of view anarchism or libertarian socialism or anything that's more on the, the libertarian left, it, in, in contrast to the more authoritarian left or more towards like Marxism, Marxist-Leninism and so on, I, I kind of see things actually more like as a process. And I actually really like that subcomandante uh, Marcos quote, um, especially like when you kind of, I forgot who, who, who posted this, but when you mentioned in detail that like, you know, don't take yourselves too seriously because there's multiple truths and we shouldn't just enforce this one singular truth. I think um, anarchist revolutions or libertarian social, socialist revolutions in the past have always been kind of like open-ended in what kind of truths and what kind of organizational structures that can that they can still allow for, even if some of them may like, like it's kind of like the freedom of giving people some some level of authority in some sense. Um, which I know may sound kind of contradictory, but I, I, I see it as a form of a process in which people can kind of come together and maybe sometimes agree that like, you know, for instance, like if you're getting bombed in a city and a general is shouting at like civilians where to go for safety, you know, is that like, that that's placing authority on someone. And I think that that's when authority is necessary and when it's not necessary, that I think should be the major distinction to be made. Now, um, I, I don't mean to like start sort of like a one-on-one -on -one discussion here, but there's just something um, Vasky said, um, if I'm saying that name right, sorry. Um, what, what do you mean uh, that the, uh, <laughs> it's the economy is supposedly like there's a very big private sector in it? I, I, I was not aware of that. So I, I just wanted to just know what you meant by that. Uh, yes, um, does everyone hear me? Uh, I, I can uh, hear you. Uh, we, we, yeah, we hear you. Uh, uh, Ariella was going to was, was, was going to say something. Did you want to say something, Ariella? No? I was going to say let's come back to this question. Okay. Um, and then let Abdukin talk. Um, I I will actually have to head out soon, but if like I can maybe exchange contacts with you or something, then you know, not not you. I mean the um. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll pause the recording too. So. Oh, okay, so okay, sure, sure. Recording. <clears throat> Optikin, do you want to go ahead? Yes, sure. Sorry, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if you are continuing already. Uh, I'm going to throw a couple thoughts of uh, from a linguistics point of view regarding these words. Just uh, really, really short about vanguard, which is also related to the word avant-garde in French. I think it's used also in English today, but it's used more when, it, when we talk about fine arts and stuff like that. And uh, they all actually go back to the medieval times 
And these were the group of uh, army or defense forces, either in a context of offense or defense, who are leading an attack, who are in front of the other group, mostly cavalry. So they are agile, they are quick, and you know, and I think we need to look at it from that perspective as well. Where did this word come from originally? And why is it used in, in our political movements today still? So, and I think in, in both the context of the Rojava and the Zapatistas and Chiapas, the, the, the groups are still playing that role of leading on the front lines. And that's how I see vanguardism. And I, I know I always say this, there is a quote from uh, Galeano, who used to be Marcos, I shit on all your vanguard parties and everything. And if, if you read that interview, he has very specific reasons why he said that in that context, because he was under attack and under personal attacks because this Basque organization criticized them in, in person. And that's the context he used this word in. This is not that Zapatistas are against vanguardism in general terms of leading people. And from there, I'm gonna to move to the government versus state context. The word government is actually a lot older before states existed and capitalist states existed, I think, because the origins of that word in Greek go back to, to steer and to guide. And even I think in uh, hunter-gatherer communities, these functions existed because they had to share things. They had to make rules. There was some rulemaking involved about how to share tools, how to make tools, how to share food, how to share resources like water or a cave or whatever, you know. Humans used to make rules of governance in terms of not dominating each other necessarily, but guiding and steering the group in a direction where we would like to go. So I think governance and government can be understood in that context as well, not necessarily as we understand it today in the context of a nation state, which is always oppressive because it comes from a capitalist system, which just can't be otherwise, right? It's the very definition of it is making of profit. So I give you X and I take, X plus Y back. There is the, that, that's basically profit. So if you look at government versus state, and when the Zapatistas say buon gobierno, the good government, that's what they're talking about versus mal gobierno, the bad government, which always takes away and gives very little back. So I think uh, we, we need to think about also what do these words mean? What they have meant also in past times before we ended up today? That was it, thank you. Sorry guys, I'm just, I'm gonna be heading out right now. So um, yeah, have a good day, everyone, bye. Yeah, you too, Gregory, thank you for coming. Yeah, no worries. I I think uh, the next the next person with their hand up was was uh, Flint. All right, so uh, I'm going to do a little experiment here and see what I can get away with. Um, little funny story uh, that I was reminded of by the discussion about the pictures of living politicians in Rojava. The SDC office has a pretty specific goal in DC, in that it wants to be meeting with U.S. politicians. You know, the Pentagon, the State Department, members of Congress whoever in authority that will speak to them so they can lobby for the things that uh, the autonomous administration needs. And so they spend a lot of time in their offices. And of course, in every politician's office in America is photographs of them with all the other politicians that they meet on a regular basis. They show who they get to meet in these pictures so they can show who they're politically aligned with and how powerful they are based on who is in their photographs. I'm sure this happens and other countries all over the world. But the Kurdish freedom movement does not do that. They do not want to do that. They're against it because they don't want to empower individuals in that way. Uh, so we had a task to, you know, decorate the office because we expect people to come and visit. 
And so we got together some of the pictures of the admin administration officials meeting with American politicians. They wouldn't have it. They would not have those pictures up on the wall. Uh, and so we argued about it and went back and forth. And this is also good because, you know, they regard people working with them in the movement as now part of the movement. We're not somehow isolated and separated from it. Our, <clears throat> our opinions are meaningful and we do discuss it. So we came up to a compromise. In the event that one of these American politicians should visit the SDC's office, we will take those photos out of the closet and put them on the wall. But once they leave, they're going back in the closet. So that's a, a pretty good example of them trying to work with the state systems and their expectations as they are versus what they want to do in their daily life and how they run the autonomous administration. So we do, however, have photos on the wall of all the martyrs, uh, primarily the US volunteers that were martyred, but also some others. Um, and because the SDC has a specific role and is not simply a branch of the PYD in DC, it actually has no photo of Ojalon. So, uh, and you know, in, in my viewpoint, the SDC is actually, because of its composition, uh, to the right of the PYD, uh, politically speaking. Yes, uh, Paul, Michael Israel does have his photo. All the American volunteers who were martyred uh, do have their photo in the office. Anya, did you want to jump in? Uh, I can go after Rory. Ah, uh, yes, sorry. I might, yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> I think oh. you're doing progressive stack now, Ariella, so thank you. <laughs> but uh, I can go after because, um, I didn't. I oh. didn't even see the hand, sorry. No, you go ahead, Rory. I'll go okay. next. Yeah, I was, just, I was just going back to this. Um, I think it's really interesting, like, um, I mean, if you go to, I mean, the kind of really famous, anarchist revolution, I guess, is Spain in 1936. If you go to, um, in 1936, um, just before the outbreak of the civil war, there was a, a meeting within the FI, which is the Iberian Anarchist Federation, about the Nostoris group, which was this anarchist affinity group who had Deruti and a lot, lots of other famous, Garcia Oliver, lots of other famous anarchists in it, and their concept of taking power. Um, so that, then the Nostoris group was really criticized um, for like, they were called anarcho-Bolsheviks and they were called, um, you know, that if, if their program had been kind of implemented, it would have led to kind of the same situation as, as the Bolsheviks did, which, which led the CNT to kind of have this collaborationist approach with, with the Republican government, which kind of it's quite complicated, but it you know essentially destroyed the revolution. And I think it's a really interesting, um, interesting dynamic because there's a similar thing maybe in Rajava and in Chipas, in, in which you have um, um, oh, and like Bookchin and whatever kind of criticised the actions of the CNT for not for not kind of constituting themselves as I don't know, what you would you know not constituting themselves as a revolutionary government revolutionary anarchist government declaring libertarian communism um so i think this is really interesting dynamic in which like you know a lot of uh i, I guess it goes back to my previous point but this kind of idea of vanguardism um is really commonly associated with um with marxist leninist movements but it's this kind of i think um what both the Zapatistas and the uh, Kurdish freedom movement do as this kind of syn synthesis of a uh, lots of maybe the failures of historical anarchism um, are quite interesting because if, you know, at the start of the civil war, if the P PYD had not kind of taken initiative as a vanguard, um, there wouldn't have been a revolution, you know? Um, because there wasn't this kind of mass popular action from below. Um, but at the same time, there were vanguards which sees the problems with vanguardism and attempts to abolish themselves. And the extent to which that's successful or not is, you know, debatable. But um, 
yeah, it's just a really interesting dynamic. I, d I don't know what everyone else's thoughts are on that. So I actually have a thought about that, Rory, but I'm going to let Vasek go next. No, that wasn't me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let's sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Anya. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to address the question of Vanguard, but you know, feel free to continue after my comment. I wanted to bring up another a different question that I had although related when I was reading the readings for today. Um, you know, looking at the you know the trajectories of evolution of both movements and how they got to you know the point of um, sort of shifting away from Marxist-Leninism or vanguardism towards um, a different you kind know, of philosophy, more autonomy-oriented, direct democracy, etc. And um, like the authors um, from the Roar, we read. Uh, I mean, we had assigned uh, two articles from the Roar magazine and they um, you know they briefly situated uh, the Zapatistas and Rojava um, sort of within this moment of um, I guess um, like direct directly democratic spontaneous um, I'm not sure how to describe them best um, you know um, um, not uprisings but uh, kind of popular actions um, like the square um, the square movement, um, I guess they mentioned Argentina, the occupied uh, work uh, places, Greece, etc. Now, I was wondering, like looking at the trajectories of the PKK and Zapatistas, I was wondering if we can really kind of see this as uh, one big moment when uh, certain kind of conditions, uh, political, economic, um, that they're kind of facilitate this shift from a, a more centralized approach to organizing or taking the state right approach um, to social transformation towards more sort of build here and now and transform the relations, relationships here and now, like uh, whatever you're organizing. And then, um, but, but the movements, I think, um, you know, have uh, had different incentives at least it seems to me to to shift their philosophies, right? With the EZLN, at least like the readings that we read for today, it's framed more as an encounter of urban mestizo guerrillas who encounter this other worldview and ways, tra traditional ways of organizing of the Maya indigenous communities. And you see this transformation kind of fusion um, and more, you know, it becomes a more communalist approach, right? And then you have the failed negotiations with the Mexican government. And that sort of forces them to just kind of retreat and focus on their autonomy because they see that uh, you know, they're not gonna get, you know, their demands met by the Mexican government. And then with the PKK, and with PKK, the emphasis like always, right? When we talk about this paradigm shift as they call it, the emphasis is more on the, you know, the collapse of Soviet Union. And even before the collapse, they apparently, right, um, I think the article mentioned that really in the 80s, they kind of saw the problems with this um, state socialism, bureaucratic state, etc. And I don't know, maybe we can also include the women's factor um, for the PKK becoming a mass movement in the 90s, right, so that they probably that sort of forced them to kind of seek like different approaches. Yeah, I was just wondering, I mean, it feels like they have, the movements have been forced by different factors towards this uh, shift. But at the same time, like there is, seems to be a moment, a wider moment, like a global moment where we see more and more like this uh, sort of uh, directly democratic autonomous uh, initiatives uh, coming up. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Anya, and thank you for, for reminding me that you were in the that you were in the stack first. I really appreciate that. Um, Fasek, do you want to do you want to go next? Ah. Um, yes, uh, Anya raises interesting points, sort of like what is it exactly in our time that that forced these Marxist-Leninist group into, into retreat? Well, I, I think historical failure is one. Um, the end of the Cold War is, 
I think, a, a big thing here because uh, parties that identified themselves as Marxist-Leninist had massive uh, support and funding from the USSR, which now they did not have. And, uh, yeah, and basically historical failure, I think that just, uh, they, they could see that just simply it didn't work, right? especially from an economic sense. Um, to have a, a command economy in the style of a Soviet Union is, is just, you know, historically unworkable. It might be a little bit more workable now with uh, big data, high tech, computerization and so on, maybe. Um, so, uh, but I think in the case of PKK and Rojava and BYD and so on. I think two big things here play a role. Um, one, the, the big massive stalemate, I think, of the PKK within Turkey in their, in their war. Um, also, uh, maybe. Um, then uh, in, in Syria, uh, what happened there was that the regime withdrew withdrew its forces out of Northeast Syria, leaving a vacuum. Um, so, so I think the, and the PKK had, had its ideology, it had its, uh, had its kind of a historical institutions, which they, which they practiced in, within, uh, I think, Bashur, right, South, South Turkey. So they, they had a, a a clean, well, I wouldn't say exactly a clean slate, but a, a space within to implement it. They didn't have to break eggs, right? They didn't have to go and kill regime forces and so on. Um, so they could, um, that, that basically the, they were the only ones with ideas, right? And the organization within that region. Um, so, you know, I, I think if they actually had to depose a government, actually fight against regime and so on, uh, Bashar forces, it would have been much more bloody and probably far more uh, confused in that sense. So they were the only ones with the capability to take the lead. Um, their victory against ISIS also with uh, with United States help, especially air power in Kobani, that's actually what turned it around, right? The uh, air power that, that gave the SDF an advantage over ISIS, since it hasn't got its own air force. Um, so, yeah, so that's one thing in Ocalan being imprisoned, right? So that limited his cult, so he, he has this cult of personality, but it's absent. But at the same time, nobody else has the, has the presence or the charisma maybe to fill or, 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 to, or to take that, take that uh, place of Ocala. So he has this charisma, no one else can take that place and he's locked up, right? So what happens is that you have a more democratic kind of uh, um, organization where no one takes on that charisma, but follows the ideas, right? So in other words, it's the ideas that drive the process, not a charismatic personality. Although the charismatic personality is there in absence. Uh, um, so paradoxically, that, that's, that's maybe one thing that kind of made it more bottom-up democratic. Uh, Subcomandante Marcos actually said an interesting thing. I think once he said, um, the character of Subcomandante Marcos doesn't exist. It was a hologram. <laughs> I think uh, the people of, uh, of Chiapas have just canceled him, you know, something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, but again, this issue of vanguardism, I think, is, is extremely important within Rojava because unlike Chiapas, Chiapas, um, I, I don't understand it 
very, very well, the Zapatista movement, but to me, it seems a little bit more homogeneous, right? In the sense that it uh, has a, uh, within the ESLN ranks, the, the ethnicity is far more narrow, right? Whereas scope is narrow, whereas uh, within Rojava, you have, you have extreme diversity, right? You've got Arabs, you've got Kurds, You've got Azerbaijanis, you've got Turkoman, Armenians, Syriac Christians, and so on. Uh, apparently, when the, the SDF liberated uh, Raqqa, which was the seat of the Caliphate, they refused to go in first. They actually uh, uh, got the, the, the uh, Arab, Arab parts of the, uh, of the SDF to liberate it. Right, so that so that it wouldn't be seen as a Kurdish victory. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's one thing. But it, within Chiapas, I think it, this 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 uh, um, bottom up, I think, works more without problem because you have first of all the the communes are probably quite a bit smaller, and it's only those communes. Whereas northeast Syria, you've got cities to deal with. You've got Hasaka. You've got Kamishili, right? So the majority of people living within Rojava are outside this communal space, right? This communal space I read somewhere only makes up about 12%, maybe less of the economy. The other economy is, uh, is a market trading economy, right? You, 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 you still, so, so all, the, all the, the land has, you, you cannot sell and buy land in Rojava. Uh, those landowners that didn't feed, that didn't leave Rojava during during the war, uh, that 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 land wasn't confiscated from them. So you've still got a private sector. You've got big farms within Kam Kamishli and so on. So you've got a kind of a three sector economy. You've got communes, you've got the private sector, free markets, and you've got a war economy. And then answers its economic committees where it sets things like price controls. Um, it, it, it has, it has uh, massive import duties from which it, and then of course the oil revenue that it gets, this is where it funds uh, public sector projects, you know, things like roads, dams, electricity, that kind of thing, which the communes cannot save for to invest in, right? I don't think Chiapas has those, those problems on, a, on as large a scale as, as uh, Rojava. So that's where the tension comes in, right? There are certain economic like imperatives that you have to deal with, you know? So if, if you're gonna put, let's say, high import duties to fund public sector projects, right? Because a lot of the stuff that, that you need has to be imported, you can't make it. Rojava is made mostly an agricultural economy. So if, if you do, if, if you do that, then that actually puts up prices, right? Which is in, a, again, conflict with what you want to do. You want to have those prices lower. And then you don't control your own money because the money that circulates within Rojava is printed in the central bank of Damascus, right? That money is devalued because <laughs> the central bank of Damascus, right, had its foreign reserves in Lebanon, the Lebanese banks went bust, right? This created a massive devaluation problem of the Syrian pound. And this again uh, uh, has a problem with imports, right? The import prices go up, right? So these are, these are problems that I don't know can be handled by one commune at a time. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you say something, Ariella? No, I was just calling on you. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that perspective, Vasek. I think that that's um, that's something that I definitely hadn't uh, hadn't thought about to such detail. Um, the thing that I wanted to say, I cannot remember for the life of me who it's in response to, but I think it's kind of like a general thing. Um, which is that I think there's an important dimension to the question of vanguardism and where it comes from. 
Um, I think it's worth remembering that not everything about, like it definitely, ha both of these movements, the Zapatistas and, you know, Northeast Syria, democratic confederalism, um, both emerge out of a modern context in the sense that they are geopolitical movements that like happen, you know, during the 20th and 21st centuries. Definitely cannot lose sight of that. At the same time, uh, Zapatismo also emerges out of deep Mayan traditions that go back millennia, like they go back a very long time. And the same can be said of democratic confederalism. Um, it's kind of a merger of like these modern communalist ideas that come from philosophers like Murray Bookchin and also Kurdish culture that goes back again millennia. Like some of the oldest, you know, religions in the world are, are Kurdish, um, like the Yazidis and stuff. Um, and so I think that that is a really important dimension to this question of vanguardism that I think has very important implications for like North America. Um, as we consider things like the land back movement. Um, I think that like, you know, the, the, these things to me seem like they are very tightly woven together. Um, and I, yeah, I, that's that's mostly what I wanted to say. Um, I think that the next person on my screen is you, Ariella. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I, I know there are people before me. Um, then is, is it still okay to speak? Or? Um, I would say yes, because progressive stack, and I haven't heard you say much other than moderation. Thank you. Yeah, just in agreement with this, um, I think what's interesting, especially looking more into just like indigenous crit critical theory, is the importance of understanding, you know, kind of these. Um, indigenous cosmologies, um, epistemologies, and the way in which this is taken up into the revolutionary question and about self-determination and the ways in which Western philosophy doesn't take these things um, when you're especially, especially looking at this developmental model. Um, it's not, you know, it's specifically for Western capitalist modern state and not states that, you know, are kind of, not fully capitalist, but not fully um, incorporated. I guess that's all I wanted to say. Well, th thank you for that. Um, I think that the next person I see is uh, is Daniel. Uh, yes, hello, um, everyone. I would like to just um, speak on um, that. Um, it was a very valid point brought up by um, uh, Vasik. Um, uh, about the uh, scale of um, the revolution, precisely like how it needs to be, um, how all this is going to be coordinated on a massive scale, essentially. Um, interestingly enough, there is a historical parallel, actually, that was present um, in the Spanish Revolution. They actually, it appears that they encountered a similar problem, the CNTFAI, um, in addition to like the factionalism that Rory was talking about. Um, factionalism. So um, we definitely agree on um, that there would be have there would have to be um, some form of like maybe like um, it would be possible to integrate both systems like into one. Like I mean like would it be I mean this is more of a question. I mean I'm just saying like for like anyone who wants to answer would it be possible to integrate some form of like dual dual federalism? Um, which is similar to what the CNTFAI were planning to, they were planning to implement something similar, like in 1937, like when they saw like that, like um, what they were proposing was like ineffective, like in a war situation, like in a war situation, in a civil war situation. And they needed like um, mass mobilization. They needed some, some degree of mass mobilization in order to like properly coordinate all of their activities and efforts. It's sort of like a beneficial conclusion to um, the, um, to the, um, the anti-fascist forces, um, the civil war. So, I mean, um, again, there is the anarchist argument like that um, the state should not be reconstituted like in any manner, in any way, shape or form, and that it should be um, abolished on essentially day one of the revolution. But um, the question is how would that be done in the context of a war economy? Like, um, especially like in this, when this question also is true in the case of Rojava. Um, if maybe Anya could, or, some, or someone could speak to that. I mean, like um, someone who may know the answer, or may have like a, um, an answer could speak to that. Precisely, um, 
um, how it can, um, how can like um, the question of scalability, um, how can that be reconciled with revolutionary imperatives? Uh, thank you. Paul, I have to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ariela. So um, I want to, in addition to, you know, looking at the, the content of the readings, but also uh, some of the comments that Optican made at the beginning of the uh, session, uh, if we look in terms of uh, Rojava and uh, Chiapas, past, present, and future, looking at the question of staying power. And I think that this is a very, very, very uh, important uh, aspect of this, and this ties into many of the uh, of the compromises that AANES has had to make in Rojava. And David Graeber talked a lot about this in 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 some of his readings, I think it was in Dare Imagining, that the, the ANES has to sometimes simultaneously be an anti-state actor and also incorporate some of the state aspects. But if we look at that specifically in terms of the future, I think a, a big, uh, a big uh, event that occurred after Erdogan and the jihadist invasion of, of Serkania and, and Grespi and and parts of Rojava in October 2019, a lot of people were afraid this is the end of Rojava, it's going to collapse. I, I think that Rojava has survived in many ways because of its staying power, because the model has been such a, a resilient model that's been able to adapt and that's been able to connect with the, the, the population and and that, you know, whether it's Assad or Putin or Erdogan or all of these Potentate, they were not able to negotiate away the reality of Rojava. And so my the question is, if we contrast that to, to Chiapas and to the Zapatistas and their their governance, their 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 ability to enforce in terms of their vision today versus the Mexican state, for example, uh, do we see a situation where uh, you know, AANES has some degree of survivability because of its functionality, whereas uh, the Zapatistas are in great danger because of that asymmetry, both in terms of the, the balance of power militarily, but also in terms of how much their model has been able to become rooted in society. And that could be to Flint, could be to Optigan, could be to Ariella, you know, Alex, wh whoever is. David, did you want to speak? Yes, kind of to that, because, but not entirely to that. Um, and others can can re can respond um, after me, because um, when you you look at this, as the staying Rojava has has staying power and. It is still within the boundaries of Syria, and you know, it's within the state of Syria as a non-state in a state. So it's both and neither. Um, the Zabatistas have a similar thing. There, there is this thing that's Mexico. There is this thing that's Syria, and within it is this autonomous region, which there's no real analogous thing to these entities since um the consolidate since since the, since the medieval times really um but what i what i wanted to say is you know about six years ago a little more than six years ago i i, I wrote something um i'm not gonna read all of it um with the title of the most important ideas you never heard of Kurdish Rojava and egalitarian ecological revolution um, to some liberal Democrats who didn't who didn't know um, who wouldn't have not have known about uh, Murray Bookchin who was a friend and, and teacher of mine for many years um, and the uh, and and the ideas that ended up being um, part of Rojava this is this is right after Wes Enzina's article about um, a dream of a secular utopia in ISIS's backyard in the New York Times um, and Ursula Le Guin had written a book called um, The Dispossessed in which she attempted to incorporate a lot of these ideas into science fiction and 
the the moon on which this was in this science fiction plot was basically a colony to the um, uh, Daniel, then you're probably familiar with this book. Um, it was a colony. And we find out about halfway through the book that it's a colony of the world and that they ship the anarchists off to this, to this moon. Um, but at the end of this piece that I write, I say that a revolution has its moment, whether it's the Arab Spring or the Occupy Movement or 10 days that shook the world, there is a time when a spark hits some kindling and a time or place ignites. Whether the flame becomes strong or withers without additional fuel or gets put out violently always remains to be seen. And so now we have Rojava, a man serving a life sentence in Turkey, found one of Murray Bookchin's books, decided to read them all about other stuff incorporated into, into um, the Kurdish um, ideals and, and and being, um, I'm adding a little bit here, um, and then convinced his followers to create a real life laboratory of liberatory expression. In a most difficult historical situation, in a most remote region, surrounded by enemies on all sides, this egalitarian exercise could well, could almost be on a fictional moon, but it is real. Then again, Marx did not foresee Russia as the ideal place for his revolution either. And yes, it has staying power. And it has staying power given the circumstances and the, the quirks and vagaries of what's going on in Syria. And how does it remain an autonomous region within a, an autocratic state? And this will be a very interesting thing to see how this plays out. And it, I sure hope it does. Um, and we'll see what happens with this revolution. It's, 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 I'm, I'm, I support it fully. I, 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 I want it to succeed because it shows that these ideas can work. And, um, and it has staying power as, as was mentioned. And it remains an autonomous region within a state. And, how sustain we'll see how sustainable that is and i sure hope it does so anyway that's my piece thank you david um so i i see i see that there are uh four questions up. um somebody has yeah thank you thank you david um so I, I see that there are four hands up is what i count on my screen um and given that we're kind of running close to time do we want to cut it off there how, what, do, what do you what do you think ariella yeah that sounds good to me uh how does is everyone okay with this <laughs> okay I, let's take the remaining comments and then and yep, then that yeah. sounds good Okay, so I think the first one that I saw was Flint. Hi, yeah, so anarchists uh, most of the time have lost their revolutions. So that hasn't burdened them with having to put a uh, utopian idea of exactly what they want to implement into practice. Uh, the Zapatistas communes and uh, Rojava, the autonomous administration there have both outlasted every self-declared anarchist revolution um, and in Rojava, you know, when they got started with their social contract, uh, they made a correct uh, libertarian decision that they did not want their state-like polity to have the power to execute people. Uh, now, this is a, a position that many non-anarchist states have also come to. It's not worth the trouble, uh, but many other states still do do capital punishment. Uh, and then they won in their fight against ISIS. Uh, largely, and they had thousands and thousands of ISIS members surrender. Well, they can't execute them. If they handed them and sent them to Assad, or they sent them to uh, Iraq, absolutely, these people would be immediately executed, uh, with probably not even so much as a show trial. Uh, and for years now, the autonomous administration has been trying to find a way that both the international community will accept, and that they will accept with what to do with these prisoners uh, and how to do it in the most humane way possible. And I generally think that the international community 
uh, doesn't want any kind of ethical solution for these prisoners and would be quite happy if they just all died. Um, and that is not the approach the autonomous administration wants to. Uh, and this is actually in somewhat opposition to a popular sentiment in Rojava, which does want uh, blood for blood in this case. Uh, they don't necessarily want to keep this rule, but it is a, it is a conundrum. And it's particularly a conundrum that any anti-authoritarian or libertarian socialist revolution would face because uh, very likely at least dozens, perhaps hundreds of individuals that had surrendered, there really is no probable chance for them to be reformed, uh, particularly not with the limited resources that uh, the autonomous administration has at its disposal. Uh, but they did not join and start this revolution because they wanted to become jailers. Most of the Kurdish freedom movement has had terrible experiences within the Karakal states of Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and uh, of course Assad in, uh, in Iraq, including leadership of the party. So it presents a real problem uh, and a real conundrum, and it is a representation of the most power a state can have, which is imprisonment and execution. So I don't necessarily think that there is a easy answer, and I, I don't necessarily think uh, that imposing a utopian idea uh, is the basis by which we should compare any polity. And so I think earlier, uh, I think it was Tabitha, was saying they prefer to look at these things in terms of a, of a spectrum. And if you decide to look at the autonomous administration spectrum, where the Zapatista communes is a spectrum, they fall well on the libertarian socialist side of the equation in which they have a very small prison population. They do not quickly arrest people. They allow all manner of dissent to exist. Uh, and you know the conditions by which prisoners have are as best as they can be considering their situation. Uh, and even groups like Amnesty International, uh, you know, does not criticize them largely on that basis. So I think if you look at that and the way they want to make change of the economic system, you know, there's still communists, still people who believe in central planning in the Economics Commission, but they don't want to impose it in the past, specifically because they say in past socialist revolutions, it was imposed without the people having popular acceptance of it or understanding of it. And so we are focusing on building the cooperative economy as a way of explaining what it is we envision and to show them that works and to progress from there. So they're attempting to convince the people, even though they do have the power to impose it, absolutely. One of the aspects of the economic boycott imposed on Rojava by the world is it empowers the administration to do what they want with the economy uh, because no one else is really uh, able to get in there and no one wants to invest really uh, outside of a few situations. So they could do a lot more than they're doing, but they do want to try to convince people that they should go along with it. So I think it's best to look at it as a spectrum and to compare it to uh, its region compared to the experiences of the people they're in, uh, and try not to think that the perfect should be the enemy of the good. Max? Uh, yeah, kind of, I think we talked about this might have come up last read, a different reading group, but also related to Ariella's point, kind of. Um, the, the Kurdish struggle and Ojalan's writing really have a mythic context or narrative, which is, which in some, which is kind of very specifically related to a Kurdish culture and their and Kurdish identity as an as an oppressed group with a long heritage in the Middle East um, and like his which isn't fully appropriate everywhere to just like, copy it everywhere and um, I think mean, it can like Ojalan's narrative of state and capitalist civilization versus democratic, and Neolithic civilization, like the principles, some of the principles are similar, can be can be translated, but the exact, but like the narrative 
sometimes gets lost. And that also the um, the readings from this week reflect that as well from the Zapatistas about don't don't copy us. Uh, a plea not to copy the organizational structure of the Zapatistas, but rather to rush back to their own lands and try to do what you'll decide to do and like bring back the principles and apply the principles to your own context. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Max. That was a really important point. Um, I think that uh, I think that Vasek is next, and then Daniel. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to give a bit, a bit more of a prosaic analysis, a bit less poetic, but I think Rajava's staying power has more to do with it has found a space within the balance of opposing forces. Right. So Turkey, Syrian regime. Uh, Iraq, all right, KRG. So, and then all the other players like Russia and Iran and so on. So, no, no power has as sufficient. Um, yeah, none of those countries or regimes have sufficient power to impose a unilateral decision onto Syria. All right, Assad is too weak to do that. Is so that's why he's left that vacuum. Also, the Kurds were pragmatic enough not to attack him, right? Very clever. So they've stayed neutral with Assad. Assad has let them. Assad need, also doesn't want too much interference from Turkey, right? Which Turkey is now, you know, controlling parts of the northern border and so on. Then there's the USA in opposition and, and so on, right? And Russia. So Rojava has found a space to survive within these opposing forces, right? Which is, but unfortunately, Rojava does not control that, right? We have to, we have to remember this. Rojava doesn't fully, it, it can take advantage of it, but it doesn't, at the end, it doesn't control it, right? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Vasek. Um, yeah, Daniel, go ahead. Yes, I think that it is um, easier. I mean, I mean, in general, like um, like looking at the historical parallel of um, the Russian, sorry, the Spanish Revolution, precisely um, how I mean during the Civil War type situation. I mean, it is easier for. Um, it is, it is perceived as easier to institute revolution. I think it's a question of instituting revolutionary policies, what, what like um, versus whether like actually spearheading an effort to instigate a revolution, like a revolutionary effort. As I mean, um, cause I mean, in this case, like um, in the case of Spain also, I think the imperative of winning the civil the war would be more immediate. It was far more immediate than instituting revolutionary policies. Really, because I mean, like, um, what's what they have right now in Rojava is kind of like a very like um, tenuous relationship between various factions, really, um, like various factions that are united within um, the ANES, A N N E S, which are essentially united to um, oppose. They were united on like a um, an ad hoc manner, like um, in a um, an ad hoc manner, really to confront the threat, the immediate threat of ISIS, and also to confront the threat of um, the Syrian state, of um, the Shad regime. So, um, so I mean, it's a question I think of, um, I would say just of timing and prudence, really. I mean, this is just my take. It's a question of timing and prudence, really. Um, because I mean, fighting a revolution is one thing, but I mean, actually like um, putting in a necessary dedication, effort, investment and time and instituting the policies to make said revolution happen, come into fruition is something completely different. I mean, because one thing is like you need, you have the imperialist, um, the capitalist um, and uh, sadist forces that need to be like dealt with, right? Like um, that need to be dealt with in order for a revolution to be successful. And also they have Turkey and the KRG um, in, in the north and you know, east, respectively. 
so um i mean i would just say i mean like if if they're really bent on instituting an anarchist revolution, which I mean, it seems like it or something, then I would just say that winning the war seems to be the imperative right now. The war effort seems to be the absolute imperative. And then maybe like um, deciding like how, how the society should be reconstituted, how the economy should be reconstituted. Maybe it's something that they should, is that something that they should worry about later after the war is over? I mean, I, I, that's, that's my um, two cents. Right. I think that that um, that about wraps us up. Do you have any like closing thoughts, Ariella? No, I think that's you know it's really good a discussion, and I appreciate everyone's comments. Um, is there any other way? Um, I think Anya posted about ways to get connected. Um, if anyone else has other links to share, um, other organizations, that would be great. Um, yeah, so we, um, Anya is posting some links in the chat window. I presume that those go to like a Google form that we have um, that's a volunteer form so people can sign up and just kind of say what they're interested in, what their skills are and stuff like that. Um, I think apart from that, we have a regular uh, bi-weekly, I think, or monthly um, organizing calls. And those are those are open to everybody. Everybody who wants to attend can can come to those and just kind of just show up, just kind of show up and see what, again, what you're interested in, what you want to contribute to, if you have an interest in that. Um, we have some ongoing efforts right now in terms of, uh, th th so that I think the big thing is just kind of like organizing around uh, like a pressure campaign against like US politicians to recognize NES for various reasons so that they can get like better vaccine supplies, better, you know, support against Turkish incursion, things like that. Um, I think that, yeah, I don't know, Anya, do, is there anything else that you want to say about any of these things? No, that's great. Thank you, Alex. Of course. Um, yeah, and apart from that, I think, thank you, thank you everybody for coming. This was a very excellent discussion. I personally had a great time hearing from everybody. Um, I really like Tabitha's distillation of the points and the consensus. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think with that, you know, gracias and galax pas. Thank you for hosting. Have a good day, everyone. See you next time. Thank you, Alex. Oh, Thank you all. Bye -bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you.